In this tutorial, I'm going to show you the basics of setting up a Sony FX3 full frame camera with a series of Rokinon cinema lenses. Now, when you first get the camera out of the bag, it may or may not have a lens attached to it. Be careful with it if there's not a lens attached because with the XLR unit on it, you're going to find that it's very top heavy and easy to t topple over. So I like to place it down in this position if there's not a lens attached to it and not to stand it up because if it's just stood up, you're going to see that it'd be very easy to tip this unit over. So keeping it down like this. Now I'm going to go ahead and attach it to a tripod so that it is easier to demonstrate. There is a quarter 20 screw hole on the bottom and you can just attach a typical tripod plate to it. Now, if you do have a tripod plate that has a pin on, on it, you're going to find that pin is not going to be compressed by the camera body and it's actually going to be in front of the camera. Make sure that the camera is secure. Place it on the tripod. Now I'm just going to briefly go over the lenses. Inside the case you will find a number of lenses. You'll find a 14 millimeter lens, a 24 millimeter lens, a 35 millimeter lens, a 50 millimeter lens, an 85 millimeter lens, and a 135 millimeter lens. Now let's take a look at some sample shots from the various lenses. Now in each of these samples, the lenses were shot wide open with the exception of the 14 millimeter because with the 14 millimeter, I couldn't use an ND filter and I needed to darken it up so that it wasn't overexposed. So I stopped down a little bit, but for the others, I did shoot wide open and shooting wide open, then just using that variable ND filter to make sure that I had adequate exposure. Now all the shots were from the same position. I may have just changed the angle a little bit on the tripod, but as far as changing position forward or back, I did not change position. So all of them were shot from the same location. So there is the 14 millimeter. the 24 millimeter, the 35 millimeter, the 50 millimeter, the 85 millimeter, and the 135 millimeter. You'll also find a number of lens hoods, an air rocket, lens cloth, and a circular ND filter. 
a lens pen. You'll also find a step up ring. That's because the 85 millimeter lens has a different filter diameter. It has a 72 millimeter filter diameter and all the other lenses have a 77. So in order for you to use the variable ND filter, you're going to need to use the step up ring so that it can attach to the 85 millimeter lens. Now with all of the lenses, there are gears for focus and then also for the T-stops. Before changing the lens, you want to make sure that you turn the camera power off. When attaching and detaching the lens, you want to make sure that you do it as quickly as possible so that there isn't time enough for any dirt or debris to go in there. Again, inside the case do have this air rocket that you can use to blow out any dust, whether it's in the, the body cap or the, the cap on the lens or even gently inside the camera. You do not want to blow on it because if you blow on it, you could spit on it. That's why you don't want to blow. You want to use something like this to remove that debris. Now, all of these lenses, the Rokinon Cinema DS lenses are manual focus lenses. So I'm not going to be going over any autofocus features in this particular video. Now, to place the lens on the camera, you can remove the body cap just by rotating it counterclockwise and then remove the lens cap from the back of the lens and then you're going to connect dot to dot. So there's a red dot on the lens and there's a white dot on the lens mount. And just connect the dots and then twist clockwise until it locks into position. And it, you should hear it click that it's locked into position. Now, when you want to remove a lens, you'll find that it's a lot easier to cradle underneath the lens like this, and then you're going to press with your thumb the button to remove the lens, and then rotate counterclockwise to remove the lens. You're going to find that it's easier to do it that way because then you can, you have a lot more space that you can actually rotate that lens because if you start like this, you're going to find it's very difficult to remove that lens. So if you start with your hand underneath like this, it is much easier to rotate and release. Now, when you have changed your lens, you want to make sure that you communicate to the camera body what lens you are using because the camera will use that information when it is engaging the steady shot function, that image stabilization. Now, I have programmed the camera to use this custom button number four to use my menu one and changing the focal length. Now, if you want to do that, go ahead and check out the Sony website and that'll give you information how to do that. Or you can go through the menus and you can figure that out how to do it. But I have currently set it so that I can change that very quickly by pressing that number four button and then choosing the lens. And I'm currently using the 85 millimeter lens, so I just select that. And then that is communicating to the camera body what lens is being used, and then it's going to be able to do that steady shot all the better. So again, when you change your lens, make sure you've told the camera body what lens you are using. It's a good idea to mark your lens hood with the lens that it is compatible with. When placing the lens hood on, dot to dot, and then twist, and it locks into place. If you're going to be shooting with the 85 millimeter lens and you need to use the variable ND filter, you're going to find it difficult to also use this included lens hood because you also need to use this step up ring. If you plan on doing that, I would recommend that you screw the 
step up ring onto the filter first. And then you have to place the lens hood on. And then carefully you can, holding it like this, screw the step up ring into it. Now you're going to find it extremely difficult to remove it because that variable ND filter is going to spin and you can't really grip the edges of it because this gets in the way. So what I would recommend instead, if you do plan on using the variable ND filter, that instead of using the provided lens hood, you use a matte box because then you're going to have a lot more ease of access to the lens and you'll find it a lot easier also to adjust that variable ND filter. The 14 millimeter lens has a, a particular lens cap that can only go on a couple of ways. It can go on right side up like this or upside down, but you're not going to be able to get it attached on sideways. So keep that in mind. The 14 millimeter lens has a built in lens hood. Now this is not removable. Because this lens is so wide, you're not able to attach any ND filters to this. That being said, you'll have no problem stopping down to darken your image and the lens is so wide that you are going to have a lot of depth of field anyway. So stopping down is not a big issue with this particular lens. Now, if you're planning to use the 14 millimeter lens with a follow focus, one of the things you're gonna have to do is change where you put the follow focus. Typically, you would use this particular rail. However, you're gonna find with this lens, with the 14 millimeter lens, that the lens is so wide with the follow focus in this position, it is going to be in the shot. So what you will have to do is take and move it move the follow focus to another rail that's a little bit outside and then that is going to enable you to make sure that the follow focus is not in the shot. Now that's just a basic overview of the different lenses. We're going to go ahead and take a look at some of the basics of operating the camera. To turn the camera on, you'll find that there is a power switch here in the upper left hand corner of the camera. Turn it on there, and then the screen can be pulled out like this, and then it can rotate like that. Now, it does not rotate all the way forward, so be very careful that you don't damage it. But you can also then flip it this way and then lock it into this position, and you might find that's a little bit easier to operate than having it out like that, especially when later you're going to be connecting headphones. You're going to find that having that screen right out like this makes it very difficult to rotate the screen and then also have headphones plugged in there. But we'll get into that a little bit later. So we'll just rotate this screen this way and then get into the basics of operating the camera. Now in regards to recording media, you can access that right here in this little hatch. Slide down, push forward, and the hatch opens up. To remove your SD card, just press and it will slide out and then you can exchange it, download your footage, etc. And then to put it back in, press it in until it clicks in place, close the hatch, slide it forward. Now the FX3 does allow you to shoot in log which allows you to have a lot more dynamic range. And I do recommend that you shoot in log. Although that gives you a little bit more work in post-production, you're going to find that you have much better picture quality in the end. Now, if you wanted to know where that setting is, if you go into the menu, and you can find that in menu two, you can turn that log shooting on. And I currently have it in sign EI. And I'm just going to go ahead and leave it in that. Now, Although when you look at the picture on the camera, it's going to look very flat. There's not a lot of punchiness to the color or the contrast. If you wanted to simulate a lookup table or a LUT, and what it'll do is it'll simulate it on the screen 
and it is not going to burn that into the image. The other thing the camera can do is put that in a separate file so that when you're doing post-production, you can take that log file and apply it. And that gives you a good starting point. So I'm going to go ahead and show you how to do that in, if I press menu, then I can scroll over here and I can turn the LUT on or off. And then that's going to do that simulation. But again, the only way to get to that log mode is earlier changing it in menu or main two, and then you can select that. But here in main one, then I can scroll over and turn that LUT on or off. Now, to change your LUTs, you can, let me turn it on here. Now it's displaying the LUT. Now you'll notice that the, it looks a little bit more punchy. And let me go ahead and get back into that. And then I can choose my different LUTs, S-Log or 709, which is probably what you're going to be editing in post-production. You can also set your own LUTs as well, or you can import LUTs. But I'm going to go ahead and leave it in 709. And currently, that LUT is set to on. Now, after the camera's on, you're going to want to make sure you're shooting in the proper format for your particular project. To access that, you press the menu button, and then you can go through the different menus. Now, the menus that you're going to use most often are main one and main two. To get to those, you can scroll up and down here. And then after you've found that, then you can scroll to the right. And then now I am in main one. And I press that center select. And then I can change my file format that you find here. So I just press that center button. And then I can choose my different file formats. Now, when filming in either the HS4K or the S4K, you can later select a frame rate up to approximately 120 frames per second. Just a drawback to that particular format is it is a long GLP. And that's a, when it's compressing, it's a long group of pictures. So when you're doing post-production, it might not be the best for you to shoot in unless you are purposely trying to overcrank. Otherwise, you're going to probably want to sh shoot one that is this SI4K, and that is using a compression that is uh, essentially frame-by-frame frame compression. And then you could also shoot in 4K DCI, which is also an inter-frame compression. You can change your bit rate, color sampling, and bit depth here. Generally, the higher the number, the higher the quality. Keep in mind that the HS4K, although it has a lower bit rate, it is a high efficiency Kodak, and it can have a higher quality than the S4K. Now, the bit rate setting is also determined by the frame rate. The more frames you shoot per second, the more bits per second there will be as well. Now, the SI4K and the SIDCI4K are both locked into a particular bit rate, color sampling, and bit depth. Now, if you do choose the 4K DCI, and that's shooting at 4096 by 2160, you do have to, when you select it, it asks you to reboot. And then the only way to get into that mode is to press enter. And then the camera is going to reboot in that 4K DCI. And if I wanted to get out of that same thing, I'll have to press that and then it would reboot to go out of 4K DCI into one of the other 4K settings. Now, when choosing a record format, you do need to make sure that whatever that format is, it can shoot in the frame rate that you want. And again, to get to your record format, you press that menu button. When filming in either the HS4K or the S4K, you can shoot up to 120 frames per second. Again, that is a long GOP. However, that's the only way that recording internally that you would be able to, to select that. So you'll notice that when I go to that setting, I also can shoot in 23.98, 59.94, or 119 
0.88, approximately 120 frames per second. So again, if you want to be overcranking, I would shoot in that HS 4K. But if you're not wanting to do any overcranking like that, I would suggest that you shoot in the either the 4K DCI or the SI 4K. Now with that selected, you'll notice that I can select 23.98, 2997 and 5994. And 5994 can be used to do just a little bit of overcranking. You can get away with about 40% slow-mo with that. Now this camera does allow you to shoot in what's called slow and quick motion. And what that'll do is it will record at a set frame rate and put it in a time base of whatever your record format is. So if I wanted to do a slow-mo at 120 frames per second, but burn it in at 24 frames per second to give me that five times slow-mo, I can do that. Now I don't like to do that typically because then that gives me less flexibility when it comes to post-production. But sometimes I'll do that on the set. I'll go ahead and film at that in that particular mode so that I can see what it's going to look like and make sure that it's going to look good. And then later, instead of filming in that mode, I'll film in an overcranked one and give myself flexibility in post-production. But I will show you how to get to that section or that setting. You're going to find in the mode button, I can press that and then I can scroll to slow and quick motion. And if it gives you this warning, that's because I am not currently with this card able to film in that. So then what I would need to do is in my menu and then I'm going to select that HS 4K. And now I can film in that slow or quick motion. So by selecting that, currently I can shoot it at it's recording it at a 23.98, but then I can also tell it that, well, I wanted to shoot it at 120 frames per second. So we'll, I'll go ahead and do that and then show you what that looks like. Now here's a shot that was filmed with the 14 millimeter lens at 120 frames per second, but in that slow motion function. So it's filmed at a 23.98, or it's kind of burnt in at that. So you can see an example of that, and again, if I were shooting over cranking, I probably wouldn't use that mode. I would prefer to actually film at a, approximately 120 frames per second and then do my slow motion in post-production. Although using that function on the set is very useful to make sure that it's getting the, the look that you are going for. Here's an example of something that was shot at a record frame rate of 23.98, however, at one frame per second, quick motion. However, if you want to shoot something that is a time lapse, it would be better to switch your mode to the still camera mode. And then in your menu, in your drive mode, use the interval shooting function. That way, in post-production, you have a lot more control. Although, this will be taking a series of still images. So it really does depend upon your project. Now once you have set your record format, you're going to want to make sure that you are in the proper exposure settings. This camera has a base ISO of 800 and you can adjust your ISO by adjusting this dial right here. Now with a base ISO of 800, you're going to find that you're probably going to need to use an ND filter if you are in very bright locations and you're wanting to shoot wide open with your lens. But I dial down to 200 and then you notice right now that it says MM here and that's talking about the meter and it is currently says that it is 0.7 stops over. Now that is dependent upon the look you are going for. So you might be purposely overexposing or underexposing. It really does depend upon your particular situation. Now, when it comes to adjusting your shutter speed, you can control the shutter speed from this back dial right here. So if I rotate that, then you can notice that the picture gets brighter and darker.
And then on the lens, of course, you're going to control your aperture in the back of the lens here. You can control your aperture or your T-stops. Currently, it says the F-stop number there. There's a couple of lines. That's because this particular lens, you adjust the aperture on the lens, and you don't, do not have control over it with the camera body. Now, if you are using a lens that you can control from the camera body, you can adjust that setting right here on that front dial. That, that's how you can adjust that aperture. This also has a zebra function. Now, zebra is telling us how overexposed a particular section is. And you can see that I've got that zebra pattern on. And then if I wanted to, I could stop down a little bit and then um, you'll notice that that is not showing. Now, again, that doesn't necessarily mean that I wouldn't want it slightly overexposed in that section. Again, it does depend upon the look I am going for and the particular mood or that lighting situation. Now after you've selected your frame rate and your record format and the right lens and shutter speed aperture and ISO, you're going to want to make sure that you have an accurate white balance. To get the white balance, you're going to need a calibrated white card and the white balance button is right on the top of the camera. You can see this number two and it says WB. So let me go ahead and rotate this in position. And I press that white balance button and then I can scroll through the different white balance functions. And I'm gonna select this one, number one, and it has a, a little balance with a card in the middle. And then I can scroll to the right and then it asks if I wanna set it. Then I can take my white card place it in frame, and I can press that center button. And it does have this indicator that I can drag to the right location to get the white balance, which is a really useful function, especially if my card is further away and it is not filling the frame. But because this is close enough, I can fill the frame with it and select that area. And then I just press that center button here and then it says capture the custom white balance. And then I just press that again. And now the white balance is set for this particular shot. On the lens, the forward ring is how you can adjust the focus. There are marks for both meters and feet. Now you're gonna notice that when I'm focusing that you are seeing a red outline on what is focused. That's called focus peaking. That is an extremely useful tool when it comes to doing any focus pulling, especially when it comes to using a lens that is manual focus like this particular lens is. To turn that feature off, you just look for where it says peaking here. You can just press that and then you can turn focus peaking on or off. And that is that focus peaking function. Some of the other functions when it comes to focus that are really useful is this one called focus mag. Now if I press that focus mag, then it says, well, what area do you want to use to focus? I can scroll around by using the joystick or I can drag it around and then I press focus mag one more time and it blows up that area and magnifies it so that I can get accurate focus. And again, Focus peaking is currently engaged. And then I can just press focus mag again and then that turns that off. Just a few things to mention about the display. If you press the display button, it'll tell you what the different dials do. So you can see right here, it says the aperture value would be sent to the dial on the front. However, you'll also notice that there is a no symbol or it's, it cannot do it, that's because the aperture value is being set on the lens. Then you can notice your ISO and EI is gonna be that back dial here and your shutter speed, your, your time value would be by this dial here. Also when you press display, you can see that you can see your histogram here, shadows on the left and your highlights on the right. 
And then if I press it again, you will also notice that I get my level. So you can make sure that you have a level shot. That's just a little bit more about the displays. One other button I'd like to mention, and that is the function button. In the function button, you'll find some of the settings that you saw earlier, as well as you can access things like your peaking level and your zebra level. On the side of the camera, you're going to find that there is a little hatch here for your headphones and a microphone input. Now, currently, I have this XLR connected to it, so I'm not going to need that microphone input. But I would need the headphone jack. Underneath that, you'll find that there's another hatch, and in there, you will find a USB-C connector that can also be used to charge the camera, and then a multifunction connector. And in front of that, you will find that there is a full-size HDMI that can be used for an external recorder or also for monitoring. Now, when using this camera, most likely you're going to be using this XLR handle to bring in an external audio source, such as a boom microphone or a wireless microphone. If you have this handle in the off position, it is going to be using the camera's built-in microphone. For the most part, it's not going to be the quality that you are going to want, especially since it is going to be further away from your sound source. To turn the handle audio on, turn the switch on here, and then you've got a little hatch here that has some of your controls. There's also a hatch here on the back, and you can see some controls here, and I'll explain those. And then your inputs. You have a couple of XLRs that are also quarter inch connectors. And next to that, there is input three. That's another eighth inch connector that you can connect to as well. Now, most of your settings are going to be right here. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect an external microphone to this and then go over those particular settings. So I have an XLR cable here, and I'll just go ahead and plug it in. Once you have connected your microphone cable, you can set your settings for how you want your audio to be mapped. In this little hatch in the back, you've got this selection where you can go channel one, channel two, and the different inputs. In the bottom setting of input one, what it's going to do is going to take input one and set it to both the left and the right channel, channel one and channel two. And then you can make some other changes to that setting a little bit later in this side hatch. Input one, input two, what it'll do is it'll take whatever you have for input one and set it to the left, channel one, and input two to the right channel. And input three, what it'll do is it'll take the stereo left channel from your sound source, from your eighth inch, and put it to the left channel, channel one, and your stereo channel, channel your right channel, to the right channel, or input two, or in, uh, that is channel two. But I'm going to go ahead and set that to input one, and then talk about the settings on the side here. After you've set your input settings the way you want them, most of your controls for your audio you're going to find right here. In this setting here, the 0 dB, 10 dB, and 20 dB. 0 dB, you're going to find that signal is probably a bit too hot or uh, high. You're going to experience distortion or peaking. At 10 dB, it sounds like it's a pretty good level. At 20 dB, there might be a little bit of hiss that you'll hear on that when monitoring it. So I like to put it at 10 dB. And in here, the particular microphone that I'm using requires phantom power, so I will switch that to 48 volt. If you have a microphone that is powering itself or it doesn't require power, then you would just leave it in mic, and if you have a line level coming in, then you would switch it to line. But most of the time, you might be using that at 48 volt. And then I have that switched. Here is my auto manual setting for my auto level or audio levels. You're going to find that auto is probably not what you want most of the time. So I'm going to switch it into manual, and I can manually adjust that audio level. And then this switch here that says manual, link, and auto. If you set it to link, what it'll do is it will take input one and set it both to the left and right channel. And the volume for left and right, channel one and two, will be controlled just by this single dial. 
if I set it to manual, what it'll allow me to do is take and have input one at a level on my channel one or my left channel at one level, and then I can use this other dial, input two dial, and control the right channel. And that's a very useful tool if I want to have what's called a safety track. So if I'm recording audio, but I want to make sure that I don't have any distortion. I might record the channel one at a particular level and then take channel two and bring that down a little bit. And then in post-production, I would just need to be aware of that and make sure that I'm, I have the audio set at the right level. But I'm going to go ahead and switch that to link. And then I can just adjust the vol volume here. So the settings for channel two are very similar. And then I have here, I have my low cut filter. So if I have a lot of low frequency sound, if I want to cut that, then I can switch that in the low cut filter for the different channels or for the different inputs. And then over here are my controls for input three, auto or manual, and then that level. Now the handle does record at 24 bit audio, so you do have a lot of quality when it comes to that. If you're not using the handle, you don't have access to the 24-bit, it'll be recording at 16-bit audio. But by using the handle, you do have that. Now, if you want to, you can also place a microphone in this little shock mount. You can unbuckle it, open it up, and then place a shotgun microphone in there. Keep in mind that if the microphone is a narrow diameter, you're going to need to use some sort of O-ring that you can increase the diameter of the microphone as it fits inside here. And then you can lock it in. Now to plug in your headphones again, there is that hatch here where you can plug in your headphones. Keep in mind that when you're using this screen, that is definitely going to get in the way. So if you are operating it with this screen out, that screen can get in the way. So keep that in mind. So I'm going to go ahead and close that hatch, rotate it around, and then plug in my audio here. And then I can monitor the sound of the microphone. And then you will see here on the back of the screen that it is indicating the audio levels. As I speak into the microphone, then you can definitely see those levels. I can, again, adjust those settings right here on the top and change the volume settings. So I can go ahead and bring that up or down. When you see red over there, it's definitely peaking. And should be turned down but that is where you can adjust your volume settings. Now on the camera, there are two record buttons. There's one right here on the front, and then there's also one here on the top. And when you press record, it lights up. And it also indicates in the back that you have this indicator here, and it says record. Just one more indicator that the screen has that is useful information for you. And right here where it says how much time is remaining. Right now it says that I have 50 minutes remaining on this particular SD card. Keep in mind, depending upon your record format, that will also change how much space that you have. Certain record formats have a lot more compression, so you'll get, it'll give you more time. And others have less compression, and then you have less record time. Again, this does have two SD card slots. To play back your footage, hit the play button on the back of the camera, and then you can scroll through your different clips. If you tap the center of the screen, it'll begin to play, or you could also press the center of the selector here. To see information, you can press display or hide that information. And if you press down, then you also have access to other controls. Now, when it's playing back, you'll notice that you can see that the lookup table 
is being previewed, and this is the lookup table that's being previewed. Though, when you bring it into the computer, it will not have that lookup table applied. This is just, again, a preview. To stop it, you can hit the play button. You can scroll through them also. And if you want to delete a particular clip, just press the trash can button, and then you could select delete. But I'm going to cancel that. And that's the basics to playback on the camera. You notice that the battery on this is low. Sometimes you'll even get a message on the screen that says battery exhausted. To change the battery, you can go ahead and turn the camera off. I'm going to put the screen in. When you're not using the screen, it's a good idea to close that screen so that way it doesn't get damaged. And then I will remove this from the tripod. And on the base of the camera, you will see that there is a little hatch. Press that switch and then open up that battery hatch and then remove the battery and line it up and place the battery in the hatch, close it up, and then it's in the locked position. You will find that the camera does go through batteries pretty quickly. That's why it's always a good idea to have a spare battery that is charged and ready. When it's time to import your footage, regardless of the computer operating system you're using, when the SD card is put in, it will show up. And then you can double click it to open it. And you're going to find a folder called private. Double click that folder and you'll find another one called M4 root. Double click that and then you will find a folder called clip. When you open that folder, you will find all of your video clips. After you've selected the clip or clips that you are interested in, then drag it to your computer. If you were filming in log and want to be using the lookup table that you were previewing on the camera, open up that SD card from the camera again, open up the folder private, and then in, in the folder called M4 root, you will find a folder called general. When you open that, you will find a folder for the LUT or all of the LUTs that were used. Currently, this camera has one on it, and this is what I was previewing. Then I can take that and then move it into my project folder. Then when I go into my video editor, I can use that LUT as a starting point. Now I will demonstrate how to apply a lookup table from the camera to video footage in Adobe Premiere Pro. So here's my video footage and you can see it looks kind of flat because I was filming in log. What I'll do is I will go to my video effects and I will look for color correction, Lumetri color and I will drag that to my video clip and that applies it. But you can't see a difference right now because I have not applied a LUT. So I'm going to go to this section under Lumetri color in the effect controls and look for where it says input LUT. And then I will choose browse and then I'll navigate to where I saved that LUT earlier and then click open and then it applies the LUT. And from there I can do my correction and also color grading. Well, that's the basics to using the Sony FX3 camera. Now, there's a lot more to it than I could go over in this short video. I do recommend you go to the Sony website and look at the settings and inf the information found there. The other thing you'll find at the Sony website is the latest firmware. By having the latest firmware, you'll have access to the most recent and updated settings for the camera. Well, thank you for watching, and I hope you can continue to tell and live good stories.